welcome here. Um, we are very excited this morning to be able to gather together as a community on stream. Um, this morning we have more worship planned, we have a sermon from Janelle Braun, and we are very excited to hear what she has to say in her fun song, um, Luke 24, this morning. Um, I'll invite you to join us as we uh, begin singing with Open the Eyes of My Heart. so glad that you're joining us this morning for worship. We're living in wilderness times, someone said to me this week, and it seems like there's no roadmap, we're not quite sure, we're waiting to open up a little bit. Uh, it could mean jobs, it could mean more sickness and more disease. Uh, we need wisdom in these days. Today is a very special day for our church in a couple of ways. We're, we're uh, having communion this morning. And so if you haven't already done so, I ask you to uh, invite you to get some bread and some juice uh, and we'll celebrate communion a little later uh, in the service. And also we're having our Zoom AGM this afternoon uh, at which we'll, uh, the church will have a, a chance to uh, to vote on Greg Wien's candidacy for the next lead pastor of this congregation. And so after the service, I invite you to cast your ballot. The, the voting portal will be open. Let's pray together. Lord, as we 
gather scattered. We are still together in our faith. We are together in your spirit. We're together in your word. We're together at your table. And so we simply ask that your spirit be among us today. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name.
Let's pray together. Lord, in our wilderness times, you are the one who makes a way. You are the one who gives light in our dark times. And you never stop working in us and among us and through us. And for this, we worship and praise you today. Lord, as signs of spring emerge and the sun and the breeze is warmer, there's joy as we get to be outside sometimes. And at the same time, Lord, we pray for those who have found this to be a very difficult time. Juggling, homeschooling, with work, uh, struggling with financial pressure perhaps, job loss, uh, wondering about reopening the business, people who are struggling physically and spiritually, emotionally, mentally perhaps. Lord, may your presence be real among us. Heal us, we pray. Today I also pray for leaders everywhere, making decisions about opening or restricting. I pray for conference leaders, for Cam Preeb and Jason Dick at our provincial level, for Elton De Silva, Bruce Enns at our national, for Mark Wessner, our seminary president. I pray for Rudy Plett, who leads our international community of Mennonite brethren. Lord, where churches scattered around the world, each facing unique struggles and challenges, we ask your mercy, we ask your grace. At the same time, Lord, we thank you that many of us live really privileged lives. Most people I talk to say, we're doing fine. I simply ask now that the grace and generosity we have received from you, that we can pass that on. May this be a time, it's an un, it's, it's unprecedented need, but also unprecedented, unprecedented generosity. May we bless your world as you have blessed us, as we worship you now with our tithes and our offerings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
So Easter was three weeks ago. But we're still in the season of Easter. That goes all the way to Pentecost, which is the last Sunday of May. Today's reading comes from Luke 24. It's Easter Day, late in the afternoon. And our message today will be brought to you by Janelle Braun. Her message will be entitled, We Had Hoped. From Luke chapter 24 then, beginning with verse 13. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them that Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people! You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time they were nearing Emmaus, and at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, Stay the night with us, since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and at that moment he disappeared. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven disciples and others who gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. The word of the Lord. Here's Janelle with her message. We had hoped. So if you're anything like me, this pandemic has really thrown off your sense of time. Um, days seem to blend together, weeks almost seem to disappear. So I want to remind you that only three weeks ago, we celebrated Easter, and are, we are still, in fact, in the Easter season, according to the Christian calendar. So this story in Luke is, in fact, an Easter story. Sometimes it feels like we celebrate Easter Sunday, one of the biggest, if not the biggest holiday in the Christian church, and then we move on. But there are so many other stories going on here. Now, of course, we have the story of Jesus being risen from the grave. And yes, we have heard about the story of the women who find the tomb empty. But I don't know about you, I don't often hear the story of the people on the road to Emmaus, which according to Luke's gospel is happening on that very same resurrection day. When reading through this story a few more times, um, this story is probably one of the most relatable ones to me. I feel like we've all walked an Emmaus road, one filled with grief, 
or confusion, despair, shattered hope, disappointment, and a yearning. These are all things that we feel when our expectations have been destroyed. Our cherished dreams are dead and we feel like there's nothing left to do but to just leave, feeling defeated and done. Now I'm sure there's many layers um, to this and at times perhaps our road doesn't look too despairing or maybe we see Jesus on the road with us. But like Cleopas and his companion, there are times when we really don't see Jesus and he might even be right there walking alongside beside us. This is a story of a beautiful revelation into the heart and the character of Jesus. Once again, I'm reminded that Jesus is not who I think he is, and he's not always necessarily who I want him to be. Now I'm going to pause here this morning and take some time to share with you three things that I notice from this story. First, I notice humility. This is the resurrection. Is this the resurrection you expected? The king above all kings was brutally murdered and mocked for all to see. A quiet resurrection doesn't really seem like the vengeance that you would re imagine. I'm reminded of one of my favorite movies, The Count of Monte Cristo, and Andrew reminded me this is actually a book first, so if you're a book person, you can read that. But for me, I'm familiar with the movie. But in this movie, uh, the main character is wrongfully accused. He's set up, and in fact, he's sent to this horrible, gruesome, abusive, desolate prison to spend the rest of his life. While he's in this place, he dreams up this master plan to take vengeance on those who had put him in that place and wrongfully accused him. Without giving too much away, this man eventually discovers that true vengeance is not actually his, and that mercy and compassion was in fact what would free him, not revenge. I feel like this is what we see here in our Christ. We, the followers of Jesus, had hoped that Jesus would put those who had wronged him in their place. We had hoped for his resurrection to be more dramatic, more convincing, more unmistakably divine, and yet we have a story here of a man who on the eve of his miraculous resurrection decides to take a leisurely walk and join up with his fellow followers. And he approaches them in such a way not to announce his arrival, but rather in a guise of humility, so unexpected that they don't even recognize him. Our Savior continues to show us a new way, a way of love, a way of compassion, and humility. We're not sent out on this mission of vengeance to put people in their place and prove them wrong. On the road to Emmaus, I notice humility. Secondly, I notice hope. In the recent months, we have all found ourselves in an unfamiliar and somewhat strange season. I found myself hearing these words, and I myself have even been saying these words, I had hoped. I had hoped that I could celebrate my wedding the way that we had intended. I had hoped that I could get a job this summer. I had hoped that I would have been able to walk across the stage and graduate. I had hoped, fill in the blank. Just last week, Andrew's grandmother passed away suddenly, quite unexpectedly. And again, in the midst of grief and mourning, we found ourselves speaking these words. This is not how we had hoped to celebrate her life, distant and isolated from our family due to a global pandemic. We can all familiarize ourselves with the road to Emmaus. And I was surprised by how this past week, Jesus spoke to me through this passage that I had already been preparing to speak on this Sunday. In the midst of loss and grief, we have hope. I love the way Jesus reminds the two on the journey that they have a reason to hope. As they are explaining to Jesus all that has just happened, we see Jesus listen and ask questions. Once they're finished their story, then Jesus is able to gently remind them of the promise, the prophecy, the truth of Christ's resurrection. When you read the passage, you may not think that this is a very kind response in verse 25 and 26, where he says, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all of these things before entering his glory? But take note of these two things in this response. First, this response comes after he had already been walking with them and he had listened to them. He knew the longing of their hearts. And second, instead of simply dismissing their experience, he's actually affirming it. How so? When he says, how foolish are you? 
he's actually reflecting back their mental state. Wow, sounds like your mind is really clouded right now, you guys. That word foolish actually has to do with the mind, not the heart. And then the word slow to believe that he uses there is actually in the Greek, the word heart is in that passage. It's referring to the sluggishness of their hearts. You miss that when you look at the English translation. Now, of course, their mind is clouded in their, and their hearts are troubled. How often do we find ourselves in grief saying, I can't believe that just happened. But Jesus acknowledges their experiences, and then he begins to reflect back to them what he's hearing in light of the truth. In verse 27, he takes them through the writings of Moses and the prophets, explaining the teaching about what they had just witnessed. He reminds them of hope. He reorients their minds to the truth, even if their hearts may take a while to catch up. We don't have to throw away sadness to hold on to hope. We grieve. We grieve the loss of Andrew's grandmother, but we are also reminded of the life that she now has in heaven because of Jesus. On this Emmaus road, I notice hope. And thirdly, I notice healing. Now, this is probably the biggest takeaway for me. In a world marked with suffering and brokenness, I often find myself asking, how do we deal with all the hurt? How do we respond? This story is a beautiful example of how Christ walks with those in pain, disappointment, and hopelessness, providing comfort, counsel, and healing. Now, I'm very familiar with the many accounts of Jesus' miraculous healings. His ministry is full of them. All you have to do is look through the Gospels, and you'll see many accounts of Jesus healing. It's impossible to deny that this is a significant part of his ministry. But here on the road to Emmaus, I actually see a different form of healing. Before we dive too far into this, let's take a step back and look at what's going on here. Who are these disciples on the road? So we have clues, but we don't have clarity. We do know that these two have followed Jesus, but they're probably not from his inner circle. You know, the 12, the 12 that become the apostles later on. These two disciples actually go to that inner circle after their encounter with Jesus to share their story. Most scholars believe that this is two men, followers of Jesus, who are traveling back to Emmaus following the crucifixion of Christ, and they find themselves caught in an intellectual debate about what they've just witnessed. Now, of course, emotions are high, but recently I just read another perspective, one that I really love and one that I want to share with you this morning. So Cleopas is one of the named men. However, his companion remains unnamed. Some scholars actually believe that Cleopas is the same man being referred to in John 19, verse 25, where it says, Near the cross, Jesus stood his, um, sorry, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now the spelling here is different, but according to historical scholars, this name tended to be spelled many different ways and likely it could have been the same man. In this case, then, the unnamed companion would be who? His wife, Mary, the, the sister of Jesus' mother. So then this is the story of a husband and a wife on their way home. Cleopas is in fact trying to console his wife who's just witnessed the brutal murder of her nephew. There's some serious mental distress going on, emotional turmoil. Jesus is walking into a family who's walking through emotional crisis. Can you relate? Have you ever been in a state of emotional distress or turmoil? Or have you ever tried to console someone who is in this state? I can relate to emotional turmoil. Part of my own story and journey involves walking through dark seasons of the soul. Depression and anxiety are part of my journey. And I can relate to the feeling of dashed hopes, a murky cloud that seems to linger overhead and never go away, and all that was supposed to be just seems to slip away. I've come to realize that these dark seasons of the soul are also very hard on those who love me. They just want me to be better. They want me to be happy for everything to go away. But what strikes me here is Jesus's response. He doesn't show up to the two and immediately say, hey guys, I'm here. I'm alive. Look, it's me. It's Jesus. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be sad. Instead, he comes alongside them he feels with them, 
He enters into their state of being and he walks with them. Let's take a look at the passage again. Look at it and think of it. Read it not for content, but for emotion. Can you feel the emotion in it? Jesus observes the emotional distress. He enters into it with clarifying questions. He sees the sadness written across their faces, the text says, and he listens to their distress as he walks with them. He's not afraid to get close to those who are in anguish. The non-anxious presence of Jesus helps ease the two that he is journeying with. And once they get to a point where they begin to feel safe and let their guard down, Jesus asks clarifying questions. He doesn't just jump into telling them what they should do. So healing then begins as they process and retell the story back to Jesus. This is the first step. Jesus creates space and safety and they begin to open up. Now, eventually they come to the end of their journey. They'd been walking together and it appears that Jesus is going to continue on the road. But these two disciples invite Jesus to stay with them. There's an invitation. Now, as Jesus sits at the table with them and he breaks bread with them, this is when their eyes are opened and they realize that they have been with Jesus all along. But are you curious like me? Like I was curious. What was it that made them realize that it was Jesus? Now, of course, God is able to lift the veil at any given time, and he could have simply done that in this case, and their eyes were opened. Or, as some scholars allude to, perhaps the disciples were given a clue. So as Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he reached out and gave it to them. What do you think the disciples saw when he passed them the bread? His scars right? This was in fact their Messiah, Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? How does Jesus respond to those who are hurting? He walks with them. He listens to them. He reveals his own scars. And to borrow a verse from Henry Nouwen, he becomes the wounded healer. On this Emmaus road, I notice a new kind of healing. And we're living in a strange time right now. We aren't in our normal places of worship with the people that we see face to face. We aren't with our church family, among others, other family. Things aren't as we had hoped. But I want to remind you that Jesus is still present. He is waiting for the invitation to break bread with you. This morning, we are going to participate in communion together. And what a beautiful way to welcome Jesus into our Emmaus Road moments. I encourage you to take a moment right now to reflect on the past few days, past few weeks, past months maybe even. What is Jesus inviting you to through this story? Perhaps it's a reminder of humility, his quiet resurrection, a reminder that he walks in grace and compassion with those who have wronged him. Perhaps you're holding anger or bitterness, revenge, you name it. Communion is a beautiful place to lay those things down and to invite Jesus into a space and that emotion that you're feeling, to receive and to offer forgiveness. Perhaps you're hurt or you're upset, you're confused, you're sick, lonely, anxious, and you're in need of healing. Allow this time of communion to be a time when Jesus speaks truth and fills you with his healing presence. Now, perhaps you're feeling discouraged or lost, unsure of what's to come, confused by the state of our world, as you break bread this morning, may you be reminded of all that Jesus has done, that we have a reason to believe and a reason to hold on to hope. Thank you so much, Janelle. I feel like we need to just sit and soak a little bit after we've heard Janelle's word to us. I also think I want to listen to that again. There were a number of quotes that are worth remembering. The one that caught me is, you don't have to let go of sadness to hold on to hope. And there were other lines in there. Thank you so much. Humility, hope, and healing. And so we come to the Lord's table. We call it communion. 
And I've been thinking about what it means to be the church scattered. The text that Janelle spoke on, the church was scattering. It was over. They were on their way home. There was nothing to see here anymore. Well, we've been scattered now for a good number of weeks, and it looks like our worship will continue this way for the time being. What does it mean to be family when you can't give hugs and you can't hold the babies? What does it mean to be church um, when we can't sing and worship together, when we can't hear each other pray, when we can't gather for celebrations or gather for to carry the grief of our losses, our funerals? But once again, in the scripture that Janelle brought us, there was hope. There was healing in the presence of Jesus. And so we gather for this, this meal. And if you've got some juice and bread at home, you can share that when the time comes. I'd like to read familiar words from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul is writing to the church. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Sometimes we think of this, the Lord's Supper, as basically a sad event, remembering his suffering, his death, and so on. And is that but it's also a meal of hope. In the text we just read, it was a meal of recognition. It was a meal that culminated an afternoon of conversation and, yes, healing and hope. And here Jesus says, you're going to do this until we do it together in the feast of the kingdom, in the presence of Christ. So invite us as we uh, prepare ourselves to pray together. Lord, thank you for this bread. Thank you for this cup. Thank you for your presence with us as we eat and drink. May we, may we recognize you. May you heal our minds, heal our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today. And if there's a need that you have, a prayer request or some practical help, do let us know. We'll try to help you in whichever way we can. I want to remind you of the AGM. It's on Zoom and Facebook at 1 o'clock. Um, also, the voting portal is open now. If you can't stay for that, you can still uh, extend your, your uh, decision on candidating of, of Greg Wheat. I want to bless you with an ancient blessing found in number six. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, go in joy, to love and serve the Lord.